This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time. The following Care Lab podcast does not provide health or medical advice. All content is provided for information purposes only. Listeners are encouraged to speak with their health care provider for specific health care advice and are wholly responsible for the outcome of implementing any tips or information presented. Welcome to Care Lab. Welcome to Care Lab. It's Care Lab Day. I'm so excited to be here with you all. Yes, Care Lab Day is the best day. And today we have a really exciting guest here with us. So we have Lori Williams of Lori Williams Senior Services. And she's here with us today to tell us her own caregiving story and share some of the important lessons that she's learned. But first, let me tell you a little bit about her. Um, and where you can find more about her. So as I said, she's the owner of a senior placement service, Lori Williams Senior Services. She's also the host of the podcast, Aging in Style with Lori Williams. And as I said, she's recently added the title of author to her bio. Um, She just published her first book, Surrounded by Love, One Family's Journey Through Stroke Recovery. In the book, she shares what she's learned as an advocate and caregiver for her husband, Mark, who had a series of strokes on Christmas day, 2022. And we are so happy that Lori is here with us today. Thank you so much, Lori. Welcome to Care Lab. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm excited to be here. Okay, now don't get too excited yet. (laughs) uh, Okay. (laughs) You got to save, reserve your judgment for after we get done. Uh, (laughs) We got to start with a icebreaker question so we get to know you a little bit better it's not too controversial this time but it might make you think so okay. here's a question and because we're rude you have to go first um <laughs> <laughs> what is there because you have a book coming out and so mm-hmm. i wanted to know from everybody is there a book from your childhood that you still enjoy to this day um Yes, there actually is. Um, There was a book, and I'm trying to think of the name of it, though. Um, It was about, what is it? Shoot. I can't think of the name of it, but the book was about a a family that adopted children of all different ethnicities. And I loved this book, like in, I think it was fourth grade I started reading it, and I ended up adopting both my children who one is from Ecuador and one is from Korea. And so I told my daughter about the book and I I described it to her when she was in about fourth grade, I guess. And she went to the librarian at school and the librarian knew the books. I couldn't think of the name. Like I can't think of it right now. (laughs) And so, um, she, she immediately knew the book and I ended up ordering it. And my daughter and I read it through a few times throughout her childhood. She's 21 now, but I still have the book, but I just cannot think of the name of it right now. But, but yes, that is a book I still enjoy. It's, it's because we're rude and we put you on the spot. Yes, that's it. That's that's a hundred, that's a hundred percent why. Um, okay. So Mine is not as cool and meaningful as yours is. This is gonna this is gonna sound really weird. So this is like a little little kid book, like one mm-hmm. that I remember my like mom reading to me when I was really, really little. And I actually mm-hmm. like kept it and I read it to my own kids. Mm-hmm. And I cannot tell you why it is that I love this book. It's like so simple, but it's there's something very comforting about it. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's called Thumpity Thump Gets Dressed. <laughs> <laughs> is it about a rabbit? It is. Uh-huh. Yeah. Do you know it? Do you know I mean, Thumpity I, Thump? I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure I know Thumpity Thump. I don't know if I know that book particularly. Okay. <laughs> I, I, You know what? And I don't even know. There probably was like a series of books with I the character so. Thumpity Thump. But the only one that I had was Thumpity Thump Gets Dressed. And like <laughs> he basically just, he gets up in the morning and he wants to do this activity. He gets dressed for it. And he goes outside and like the weather's not appropriate for for that activity. So then he goes back inside and he changes and he goes back out again. Then the weather's changed again. And then he goes inside and changes. And then like the weather changes again. And then finally at the end of the day, he's like dressed right. And he gets to go sledding. 
Um, but I, and I, like I said, it's the simplest, like little kid book. And I can't tell you why, but immediately when you asked that question, I was like, thumpity thump gets dressed. That Love book that led book. you into occupational therapy. That should be your new story about why you became an OT. Because of, because of all the dressing? Because of all the dressing. Yes. <laughs> Maybe. It is Maybe. painful. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> A, a precursor so to my profession. Yeah, for sure. Okay. What's yours? Okay. So mine is recent because we were just at the library and they want some books for their, my kids want some books for their summer reading program. And so one of the books that was sitting there is called Miss Nelson is Missing. And <laughs> it's this uh, book about a uh, very nice teacher whose class is running over her and so she decides nobody's listening to me and so she comes back as like a witch basically and it's like a oh. super mean teacher <laughs> and what's then, her name i know i know what book you're talking about but i can't remember nelson is missing no but what's the name of the mean teacher i can't oh, remember um it, now i can't remember either I just, okay i just read to the kids the other day but mm -hmm. um the mean teacher is her because she dressed up and the kids mm -hmm. spend the whole book trying to find their teacher. And then, of course, the teacher comes back and then they all act good. And <laughs> I don't remember why I liked that book so much when I was a kid. But when I saw it as an option for um, the book that they get to win, I picked it for the two year old since she doesn't get to pick. And I read it to the kids the other day and they picked up in advance that Miss Nelson was the witch. And I was like, you guys are so smart. And they loved the book so much. I actually listened and sat and listened to the book even though, and they weren't playing around as much as they usually do. So I was like, ah, that's a win from the past brought to the past. That is a win, yes. <laughs> you know, I think like the the thing that's that's interesting about all three of our picks is it's something that we ended up sharing with our own kids. And I think mm -hmm. that's what a great book from your childhood does it's something that you like look forward to sharing with your own children mm -hmm. and it makes it so much i think that reading with your kids is so special it's one of yeah like the most even though my kids are are older now they don't really need they don't need me to read to them we still do like family reading time mm -hmm. where we will all have our own like books together and we'll just like all snuggle up in bed together and be reading our own individual book and it's the most special fun time yeah. it's just so nice to share like those kinds of those kinds of things from your own childhood with your kids. And I think that's Agreed. like one of the most powerful things about books though, is that they don't get old for mm -hmm. the most part. Like unless it's written about a current event, it, they don't get old. And so mm -hmm. I have had so much fun with my kids, just like seeing books that I remember and then reading to them and be like, I read this book when I was a kid. And, oh, do you know, this book is old enough that your grandma read this when she was a kid. Cause we got some like really old yeah. books that still are in circulation. Um, and so I also think that's why it's power, why books are powerful. So Lori, tell me why you felt like it was important to put your story into book format. Cause there's lots of ways that you could have told mm -hmm. your story. Wait, hold on. Can I just say yeah. that was the best segue I've ever heard, Brandy. But then you just had to <laughs> kill it. That you was, had best. <laughs> I've had, I had to, okay, sorry. Go ahead, Lori. Now you can answer the question now that I've messed up yes. everyone's flow. I agree. That was an excellent segue. So <laughs> I'm working on my hosting skills. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. So um, I had, before Mark had his stroke, I was wanting to write a book. I've always wanted to write a book since I was a kid. And I had was had started on a book about senior living. And so when he had his stroke, I'm just a journaler as it is. And so mm. when I was in, I mean, the first night in ICU, I didn't sleep for like three days. So I was taking notes on my phone, on my iPhone. So just in the notes section, like how I was feeling, things I heard. And I just kept thinking about um, seniors that I work with. Like, and I was thinking, what if I were 85 in this situation and no family? Cause I, we have no family locally. And, you know, I was just like, I don't know how you would cope. I mean, I, it was overwhelming for me, even with a background in senior living and, and healthcare and kind of knowing what was coming next, but it was still overwhelming. So I was just taking notes on everything. And then with my podcast, I think I took like a couple of weeks off, but when I came back, I was still processing through all this. So a lot of my podcasts were just in real time, like through the journey for that whole year, I would talk about different things. And then I just thought, you know, I think this is really valuable information to share with other people so they know that they're not alone, um, you know, with being a caregiver, the feelings that come up that you think, 
I probably shouldn't say to anyone, <laughs> you know, I put in the book those things because I think, I think it's valid for people to know that their feelings mm -hmm. are, you know, everyone else is having the same feelings. They're not alone. Um, and then just also sharing what I learned about strokes, because um, to know that they're 70 to 80 percent of the time preventable, that's a big thing because I don't want anyone to go through this. If you don't have to, if you can prevent having a stroke, that's mm -hmm. the best way to go. So would you tell us, and obviously I shared a little bit at the beginning of the podcast, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, uh, that your husband had a stroke mm -hmm. on Christmas day, 2022, Christmas day. would mm -hmm. you, but the other day I got to hear Lori speak in mm -hmm. person about this and it was, it's such like a moving and compelling story. Would you share that, you know, as much as you're comfortable with sure. share, sharing your story here. Mm -hmm. So, um, Christmas day, everything was like totally normal, like a boring Christmas actually, because we, it was just our little family. We were going to go out of town and then we didn't, we, cause we had a new puppy. And so it was just too much. So we just stayed home and dinner was late. I just feel like everything kind of came together as it was meant to, I guess. So dinner was kind of late getting done. So everything wasn't ready until seven o'clock. And so I called everyone into the kitchen. Normally we would sit at the table. Mark would say the blessing. And that day, because it was so late, we were all so hungry. We just had everything on the island and we were just going to do buffet style. And so I just said to Mark, I said, just, can you say the blessing? And he went to say it and nothing came out. And he had this weird look on his face and, and he said, you say it. And I was like, okay, something's wrong. And you know, for whatever reason, I remember there was a commercial years ago that was called Fast and it was all about strokes. And I, mm -hmm. that just stuck in my head. I'm like, I may need this one day. And I looked at him and I said, say something. And he, whatever he said, it, it made no sense. And so I immediately knew he was having a stroke. And I said, you're having a stroke. He told my son, who was 26 at the time, my kids were 26 and 19. And I said, stand with dad. What I should have done was call 911, but my mm. whole thought was fast. I've got to get him to the emergency room fast. And so I just threw on my shoes. It was freezing cold out. I didn't put a jacket on or anything. Got him. He could walk still. And he got in the car. He buckled the seatbelt. And I called my friend Carol, who's a works had worked in hospice at the time. And I said, which hospital do I go to? And she said, go to the closest. So I went to the closest, which was just, you know, a few minutes away, but it wasn't a hospital that did neuro. So this is, you know, where I kind of messed up because um, I should have called 911 and I've learned, you know, since that they take them to the right hospital. And while they're assessing them in your house, they're in contact with the hospital. They're getting ready to take someone who's had a stroke. So, you know, instead I feel like I wasted time with that. Um, just not knowing, which is, I mean, I'm not beating myself up or anything, but I just want to yeah, share. Yeah, I was going to say, like, don't be so, I mean, I think yeah. that you did what, what lots of people do. I also mm -hmm. think it's so, like, it's really wonderful of you to share that mm -hmm. with, with folks so that other people who, if they find themselves in the, that situation, they'll know, okay, I, I do need to call 911. I, yes. I shouldn't try to do this on my own. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't get stuck on the whole fast thing. Cause that's what I was stuck on. Like, I just got to get in there fast, you know? Um, but you know, we went to the wrong hospital and they had to call their sister hospital and, you know, we, they ended up care fighting him, which was a huge expense that we wouldn't have had, had we yeah. gone to the right hospital. Um, but he gets to, he's care flight it to a hospital um, like 20 minutes away. I drove up there. When I got there, they had given him the clot busting drug prior to put him, putting him on care flight. And when I got there in the emergency room, he was talking and he was like, he kind of slurred a little bit, but he said that was so weird because they were asking him, what's your name? And he couldn't say his name when he was in the first emergency room. Um, you know, um, what's your birth date? And he would just kind of like look and laugh. Like he could not recall these simple basic things. So by the time he was in the second emergency room, he was, he was saying he could talk and he just said that was so weird. And then he told me that, um, prior to saying the blessing and it not coming out, he was having some symptoms that he didn't tell me. So mm. he had been trying to call his niece and put a number into his phone and it, numbers weren't making sense to him. And 
I don't know, for whatever reason, he decided not to share that information. <laughs> you know, I don't know if he thought it was just some weird thing. I, I don't know. But um, so he ended up being admitted. We was in ICU and, you know, they confirmed he'd had a stroke. It was just one stroke at that time. And, um, you know, the next day when the neurologist came in, he said, you know, you kind of dodged a bullet here. It's looking good. Uh, probably by next Christmas, you won't even be able to tell that he had a stroke. And so we're all like, yay, that's great. The next day, though, um, I'm sitting there talking to him, looking right at him, and I just see him just go down. And uh, his face, everything just went limp and drooped. And he had what I found out later was three strokes, a stroke shower, which I'd never heard of. But they were just boom, 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 three strokes at one time. And they did severe damage, unfortunately. So, so that's kind of been our story in a nutshell. And it's been, um, you know, a lot of figuring out next steps, being his advocate, you know, he was in the hospital because of course this fell right between Christmas and new year. So it was kind of a nightmare getting through that because people weren't working, nothing was moving quickly and we were changing insurance at the first of the year. So we had all that happening as well. But um, he finally, I think it was January 6th, he was sent to a rehab hospital. Then he was in um, a neuro rehab for seven months. And then- Whoa, like a, what kind like of a, neuro rehab did a, he go Like a day, a day neuro rehab program? No. Uh, no, he lived at Pate. He was at Pate. Oh, he lived there. Yeah, he was yeah. In, in, yeah, living yeah. there. Okay. He lived at Pate for seven months and then uh, came home and he did outpatient neuro until about a month ago. Now he has a uh, neuro rehab that comes to the house for him. So, Got but it. it's been, it's been quite a journey. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm thankful that, you know, you kind of listen to, when you have those feelings like intuition and I've had a feeling in early December that I needed to get us on like a regular insurance. We were on a um, MediShare plan, which was great. I'm self-employed. So you know, it's not a whole lot of insurances available to you. So we were on this MediShare plan, which had we not been going onto the insurance January 1st onto the regular um and it was an exchange program that we went on, he would not have been able to go to the, to the hospital in hospital rehab unless I paid $80,000 up front. And I did not have $80,000 to pay up front. So thankfully everything worked out and I had listened to my intuition to get this regular insurance. It had gone into effect January 1st. And so this insurance, which is a blue cross blue shield HMO has covered all of this rehab, seven months living in rehab, everything has been covered. So that's, that's the good news. So always listen to your intuition is my other kind of takeaway from this whole story. Hey there, it's Amelia. Listen, I am so thrilled to have a great resource like Ask Sammy as part of the Care Lab team. And here's why. It's a game changer for aging in place because it makes it so simple. All you do is ask. Just type in your question or even tell Sammy what the problem is and get tailored solutions. Everything from innovative adaptive equipment to comprehensive resources. It's a great way to become more empowered, to live more independently, and to live with greater confidence. And my favorite thing about how Ask Sammy works is it's deeply rooted in dignity and practicality. So whether you're a fellow therapist, a care partner, or someone who's seeking solutions for themselves, visit www.asksammy.com. We're going to link it in the show notes so you can find it there. Start making home more accessible today. Now, back to the show. I also want to point out something that I think that you have done really well as an advocate, which you have done something that I think a, a lot of people don't realize is even possible. You have advocated and gotten way more rehab than just a couple weeks in mm -hmm. like an IPR or inpatient rehab, which is yeah. what a lot of folks end up getting. And of course, like inpatient rehab, if you have a stroke that has significant impact, really should just be the first step of the journey once you're discharged mm -hmm. from acute care, because we know that people continue to recover from strokes for a long time. In fact, we still see pretty, sig we see like 
you know, if you look at the research, we see the most recovery in the first six months. We could see continued um, substantial recovery through the first year. And then actually the research kind of drops off after that. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. but in my own clinical practice, I know mm -hmm. that we can continue to, the brain is never static. It's always mm -hmm. developing and it's always changing. And we can always use that neuroplasticity to continue to um, get positive change. And so mm -hmm. something that I want to point out that I think you've done really beautifully and that I want to you know, encourage people to do is advocate for more rehab and more therapy because recovery doesn't end a month after exactly. stroke. In fact, that's just barely, barely the mm -hmm. beginning, barely the beginning. Yeah. And so, you know, making sure that he's had the opportunity to get all this rehab on an ongoing basis, mm -hmm. like I just know has made I just know has made a difference, you know. It has. And I mean, you're right that he is, I mean, he is, it'll be two years this Christmas and he now gets where they come to him. He's on a rehab without, what is it? Rehab without walls. I always want to say rehab without borders, but that's not it. It's rehab without walls mm -hmm. is who uh, comes to him now. And he gets 24 hours of rehab a week, which is kind of incredible. Now, Here's yeah. the thing. This is the, in his own environment, which is yes, like the yes. best. The best. With our, so with a, yeah, with our dog who has made herself into a therapy dog, laying on the bed with her, you know, face on his shoulder, you know, and he's doing PT. So that's, I mean, that's beautiful. That and that's what he, you know, it it, it really makes a difference for him. But um, here's the thing, though, that I've learned. So he is not. Medicare age yet. Had we been on Medicare, these options would not have been available to us because okay. Medicare does not pay for it. I've asked the questions of because he's been at paid, he's been at um, mm -hmm. Center for Neuro Skills, and now he's rehab without walls. And so that's the problem is Medicare won't pay for it for whatever reason. Also, I want to say because we are in a big city like Dallas, he has had more, um, there are more resources because I have a friend who's a neurologist in Mississippi and she said there is nothing, nothing like this. And um, I recently had lunch with uh, someone from CNS, Center for Neuroskills, and she said that they have teams who go all over the country and will bring people from other states here to do their program. So, I mean, I think those were the things that were on our side. Now, Mark will be 64 and a half on December 22nd. And at that time, we have, he has to go on Medicare because he gets disability. So when he goes on Medicare at that time, we won't be able to get what he's been receiving. So I'm just, you know, hoping we get all of this until the very last minute until we have to switch to Medicare. And then that will look, um, it'll look different. So he'll still be able to get some rehab, but that I know that'll be limited. I think you have just dropped a whole lot of gems and wisdom in a short amount of time. And I just want to backtrack just a small bit to sure. be able to like lay that out for people and how mm -hmm. they can enact that in their own spaces. And so first of all, you reference fast, which mm -hmm. is um, a commercial thing that went out. And I think there's a new, a, a it's longer e, it's actually yeah, B fast, B fast, fast. Now. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we should say what that stands for. So the B is, is what balance is for balance balance okay balance face arm no uh, balance so it's b b e so mm -hmm. it's balance take it take it away Lori. i know you got this okay uh b is for balance e is for eyes because you can have vision uh changes when you're having a stroke um f is for face if you see any kind of drooping a is for arms um you ask them to lift their arms if one is drooping there's an issue um s is for speech which was what was happening with mark and then t is time and call 911 right and but also mm -hmm. um it's because he had a stroke that was um embolic or that was able to use the tpa in order to break up the clot the mm -hmm. first time my question to you is did you note the time and did they ask you what time it happened mm -hmm. at the hospital and were you able to provide that for them? Yeah, because it happened at exactly seven o'clock. And I know because when we were standing 
in our kitchen, we have a big clock in the family room and I was looking at it and it was seven o'clock on the dot. So I could tell them that he got the clock buster probably by 730, I would say, by the time we were there and they were talking to the um, other hospital. So yeah, he got it quickly because I believe it's a two hour time frame, and he had it probably within 30 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes. Which is why it was effective originally had we not had multiple yes. strokes. Mm -hmm. But like, it's really, in, did you, my other question, I guess, is did you intentionally note the time because of the FAST acronym or did you happen to know because you had a big clock? I had a big clock <laughs> and I just, <laughs> I had looked at it and was just thinking, oh, we're eating so late at seven o'clock. And then, mm -hmm. you know, I asked him to say the blessing and that's when, you know, okay, this is happening. And then with the um, stroke shower, the reason that the, it wasn't effective on those is that it was actually plaque that came from mm. his carotid. So, and, you know, as we learned more about what was happening with him, his left-sided carotid was completely calcified. And so there's nothing they can do to clear it at that point. Um, but it threw the, I guess, like the plaque clots. And so that's why it wasn't, the tenecteplase was not um, effective. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to highlight that because I want people to know that like that's, a, you can't have the TPA after a certain time window. And yeah. if you're not 100% sure, or like pretty close to sure about what time has happened, mm -hmm. then they can't really administer it. And that can be a big difference between what level of um, disability occurs after the stroke mm -hmm. or lack thereof. Yeah. Um, and so I'm so glad that you had like that, the acronym stuck with you and that you were able to do yeah. those things. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other thing is that I've, I'm really interested in um, some of the mechanics of the actual rehab and the stuff that you got because you see mm -hmm. my face dropped when you said he stayed at that place for seven months because it yeah. doesn't usually happen even mm -hmm. if you're on private insurance um and the intensity of the rehab that can occur mm -hmm. when you have an inpatient stay is a significantly different than what usually or typically occurs mm -hmm. um in home health or outpatient or some other mode and so especially for stroke and other neurological things. It's like so all encompassing that you really want to have as many skilled clinicians around as possible for as long as possible, get as much rehab. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us just a little bit more about, um, was it a particular program that allowed him to stay that long or were you like, no, he's not ready. And can't, can we stay here longer? No. So it was all kind of on them. So with his strokes, when he had the strokes, his, it was a, so when the strokes happen on your left side, it affects your right side. So when it affects the left side of your brain, it affects your right side. So he has severe aphasia, apraxia. And when he left the hospital to go to the first in-hospital rehab, he was paralyzed on his right side. So he left the hospital, you know, um, medical transport on a gurney. So he could not even like move. So... Once he finished the in-hospital stay, it, there was no way I could bring him home. I mean, he still um, was not able to walk at all. They had had him in a wheelchair. He could sit up in a wheelchair and things were getting better. Like he doesn't have a significant droop in his face. All that kind of like went away in like probably the first two weeks. And he initially had a lot of vision issues as well, which have since um, gotten much better. Okay. So, um, I, so, I mean, I don't know yeah. if other people like knew, but I, I asked for paid because people were telling me that because yeah. I also I work in this in senior living. So people were reaching out to me who, um, you know, were worked in home health or different things. And they're like, Lori, you need to contact Pate, which I had known of Pate. I had never been there, but I knew of it. And so I called them and I said, this is where I think my, I, my husband should go. And they came to visit him, they assessed him, said he would be right for them. I also learned later that there's some kind of mandate in the state of Texas. It's like a brain injury mandate, I think is what it's called, where you, where they have, have to provide so much um, rehab for someone who's had a brain injury, whether from a stroke or a TBI, a traumatic brain injury. So I don't know a whole lot about that, but that's what I was told by Pate. And then also CNS mentioned this, um, this mandate. So I don't know if y'all know mm -hmm. about that or not, but that's something in the state of Texas, which I believe helped us also. 
um, I think that's super important because mm -hmm. every state has different things going on. Yeah. And like, even though Missouri, for example, doesn't have paid to my knowledge or Kansas City, mm -hmm. um, there are other waivers and other things that are going on with brain injury. And so because the way our healthcare system works and the way payment works, it's all very mm -hmm. disparate. And I think the biggest thing to note is like, ask more questions mm -hmm. and connect with people who might know about things that you haven't heard of because you haven't had a reason to hear about it, you know? Exactly. So. Mm -hmm. And again, another reason why I wrote the book is that I was fortunate in that I had people who work in this industry and that were, that had knowledge mm -hmm. and were coming to me because, you know, I wouldn't have known any of this. So once they assessed him, they said he would be a good fit for paid they have three locations in the Dallas Fort Worth area. And I went and visited all three and chose, chose one that was an hour away from my house because I just felt it was right for Mark. And it was out in the country. It's in Anna, Texas. And, um, they had donkeys and horses and my husband was a farm guy. So <laughs> I just felt like that would be a healing environment for him. And mm. that was, um, six hours and they're, they're licensed like an assistant living. So, um, so he lived in, there were two different houses. You had the first house you go to and you live there and you go to therapy five days a week, six hours of therapy and it's physical therapy, occupational speech. Um, I mean, they did other things with him too. Like I think they had like a therapist talk to him, just make sure he wasn't becoming depressed. Yeah, they, they have, neuro, they have neuropsychologists. That yeah. Get there yeah. Too, yeah. So there was, I mean, all kinds of resources available. Their social worker was wonderful. She gave me a great resource that helped me get, um, disability for him much quicker. And, um, so that was, that was great. And, uh, I put that in the book as well. It's called alsup.com. If you, there's anyone trying to get disability, um, it, they, we were able to get disability for Mark as quick as I think anyone could. We had to wait three months after the stroke to apply. And then we had disability within three months. So that was kind I, of crazy. That was literally my next gym. Yeah. I was going to say you dropped because I said you, he's already on disability, which, and yeah. he's been less than two years and yes. usually it takes people that long so yeah that's really awesome and glad you were able to put that yes. resource in the book too yeah mm -hmm. i just thought it was so important because i see so many people struggling with getting disability and yes. i started filling it out on my own and i was like holy cow so yeah. when i got that resource i contacted them and i mean i think that's like a record to have it within six months of a stroke it's pretty we were, yes. it's pretty insane actually yeah. it's pretty yes. insane yeah yeah it really is so um so he did the, the therapy there and towards, I guess about maybe like five months in, he graduated to the next house, which is the big house. <laughs> and that one, it's like, it looks like assisted living. So he had like a little apartment and they start teaching him to do things like wash his clothes. And he was able to do things in his, uh, in his wheelchair. And each month our insurance would say, you know, yes, we'll continue you know paying for it. It was based, of course, on if he was getting better and participating, which he was. And he really um, has, through all of this, he's had a very strong desire and strong will to get better. And uh, which I think is huge because mindset is, you know, that's a big part of it, which I even talk about that in the book, too, that without him having that mindset, he wouldn't have continued being approved for all this therapy. So mm -hmm. he always gave it 100 um, percent. And they were just, they were wonderful. They let us bring our dog to visit him and, you know, outside. But, you know, it's just things like that that make a difference for people. So we had hoped that he'd be able to stay, you know, maybe like eight months. But at the seven month mark, they said, you know, it's, we, we feel like he can just go to the day neuro program now. He was at the point where he could walk with his, with his cane, walk short distances and transfer well. So, um, and during this time they had sent an occupational therapist to my house and Mark to figure out what we needed to do to our house. Because here's the other thing people don't realize your standard house. And like, why would you know this? <laughs> you know, um, the standard house the doorway into the bedroom is wide enough for a wheelchair. The doorway into a bathroom is not. So we had issues and like in Texas, a lot of the master bathrooms are built where you've got the big bathroom and then you have like the little potty room kind the, of thing. The tiny, the the toilet, tiny closet. toilet closet. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And there's Hate nothing, this. yeah, there was nothing we could do to fix that. So thankfully 
we had bought this house 27 years ago. And when we bought it, I still remember to this day walking in and Mark saying, this is the perfect house because the master's down. There was another bedroom and bathroom down. And he said, when we're old, we can stay here. We won't ever have to go upstairs. And so I was like, mm -hmm. haha, that was funny, you know, when we were 30. And, um, <laughs> but I just, I kept remembering that. I'm like, oh my gosh. And so I ended up having a friend who is a realtor and she has helped people redesign bathrooms and she designed the perfect bathroom for Mark. We had to blow out a closet to make the doorway big enough, but we built a huge shower, everything, you know, so that he could come home. And so I was very proactive and I think mm -hmm. that's important for people to do too, because they told me at Pate that most people wait to the last minute. You can't wait till the last minute to rebuild a bathroom because that took about eight weeks to get it completely yep. done. So exactly. you have to be on it right away. And, you know, that was one thing throughout all this, I was trying to stay a few steps ahead and know what's mm -hmm. going to be next. Care Lab listeners, it's Brandy and is the founder of a platform made to make aging in place easier for everyone. I knew it would be incomplete if we did not have education, especially for caregivers. So whether you're a family caregiver or somebody who trains a whole organization, higher standards caregiver training videos are for you. I'm so proud that we were able to partner together with Amelia in order to provide these to you because they're easy for everybody. You get great occupational therapist-led training on topics like transfers and how to care for someone as they age, or maybe as things change when you have Parkinson's. So no matter if you're the loved one who doesn't know exactly what to do next because things are getting different, or if you're a professional who trains caregivers that go into the community and you need some quality education, you get both from Higher Standards Caregiver Training. And you need to check them out at higherstandardscaregivertraining.com. Oh, so that's a great point. My question for you is, how did you try to stay one step ahead or two steps ahead? Because like, you don't know mm -hmm. what to do. This is not yeah. even an experience that you've mm -hmm. had. So what tactics did you use in order to try to look ahead? Well, I mean, I would stay, talk to the social worker a lot. And so we mm -hmm. kind of, we had the game plan. So from the moment he went to pay, which was the end, like end of January, he went to pay they were talking to me about, okay, we, we believe we'll be able to keep them until May. That was the original thought. And then, um, so I said, okay, great. I want, they told me about the occupational therapist coming out and I'm like, let's do it now. Let's do it as soon as possible. So she came early March. So it was like not putting off. And I was like, let's get this done. Like, I mean, I honestly could not sleep at night just for all the things swirling in my head. Like I've got to do this, this, and this, and I've got to keep working. I've got a kid in college, you know, it was just a lot, but I mean, I'm just, I'm a planner by nature. So I think that mm -hmm. probably helped me. So when they came out, you know, immediately I knew what we needed to do to the house. And so, you know, I got on that because my initial thought he was coming home in May and then they ended up keeping him until the end of July. So mm -hmm. everything was ready. When he came home, we were able to start bringing him for short visits at home which was nice and because I had a bathroom he could use <laughs> mm -hmm. and, uh, and he was able to transfer. So, um, so that's, that's why I think it's so important. Like know what's coming next. And I was always asking the social worker, okay, what's the plan once he's done here, what's the next step? And that's when they said he would go to the outpatient neuro, they provide the transportation. And then that was, you know, that was intense for him. And, uh, but it helped, it helped a lot. Yeah. I think one of the other like really important takeaways from listening to your story is how well you utilize your resources, um, both in the community around you and then the, the people who were currently serving Mark mm -hmm. and serving you at that time. You talk to them, you ask them questions, you ask them about that next step and mm -hmm. what that meant, you know, early on in the journey. I think that's one of the things that unfortunately sometimes healthcare providers don't always, you know, they get in the rush and they don't always necessarily do um, the best job mm -hmm. letting you know, okay, what's the next resource after this? Yeah. Because as you said, we're really, really lucky in the DFW area to have mm -hmm. two really excellent 
neuro specialty rehab centers in Pate and CNS. And that's not necessarily everywhere, but the only way that you would know that those things exist is if you are already in that world, right? Exactly. So, so asking the people around you, asking the social worker, the physical therapist, the occupational therapist, the speech therapist, the neurologist, hey, is there another level of care after this that you would recommend? Is there another resource out there that you think that we should be looking into? And how soon can I get started on that? And I think that you you know, having those conversations and really being engaged yourself as an advocate with that rehab team makes a huge, huge difference. Because if you, mm -hmm. if you don't engage with the, the rehab team and, and, you know, sometimes I think people just, the, the, you, you don't, people think, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to bother the therapist. I don't want to bother the social workers. I just want them to, you know, go do what they need to do. And like, mm -hmm. they're the bosses, but actually it's, it's all teamwork and it's all a partnership. So yeah. being engaged in that process and getting that information makes such a huge difference for the kinds of resources that you'll know about, the resources that you can get access to, and ultimately like impacting that long-term outcome in a really positive way. You know, I do want to add one thing though, and you know, I never, I don't like going negative, but I do want to say this, that in two, and I'm not going to name them, two of the places Mark was, um, the social worker case manager never helped us at all, not at mm -hmm. all. And so mm -hmm. that can happen. Mm -hmm. And if that does happen and, and honestly, I mean, I'm just thankful I had other people. I mean, I guess you could ask to talk to another social worker. I mean, just, you have to be the advocate for me after trying several times. Um, I just went to my, my resources, my, my people that I know in the industry and they, they help me. So, I mean, that was an advantage that I had, but if you run into an experience like that, where you're not getting any kind of feedback, you're not getting the resources that you need. You just have to, you have to speak up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and talk to something, you know, I think you were really lucky that you have so many connections in mm -hmm. the, like the local industry here for folks who don't make sure that you, and you're not sure who to ask or where to go. Mm -hmm. Don't just talk to the social worker, ask every member of the team who walks mm -hmm. in the door. Do you yep. know anything about this? Do you have any recommendations? Someone, talk to? at least one person yeah. should be helpful and should know what to do. And if they, if really no one is being helpful to you and no one seems to know what to do, then mm -hmm. maybe it's time to think about, you know, asking for a different provider or yep, asking exactly. to see another, another team member to get mm -hmm. those resources because someone's got to know something, right? And mm -hmm. it is the job of that healthcare team to not mm -hmm. just help you right there in that moment, but to help lay a foundation for a stronger, better recovery in the long term, no matter exactly. what level of care you're at. Mm -hmm. And at the bare minimum, at least help you know how to do the next step, even if they don't yeah. walk you through the whole process, but mm -hmm. like at least help you get to the next step. Mm -hmm. If you're not getting that, then reach out, you know, mm -hmm. and like, even if it's to somebody who's not in your area, just somebody who's in healthcare or the yeah. shoot literally at ask Sammy and find a clinician there who can help you navigate. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's really the most important part. And, uh, I'm so, I, I'm so conflicted. I think I'm, mm -hmm. it's sad that you have to, you and the greater you of mm -hmm. all of us in America have to be such big advocates mm -hmm. for our family members and friends in the healthcare system. And it doesn't just flow in easily like that, but I'm really glad that you were able to navigate in that way. And then also share all of those um, learnings with others so that they can also find ways to apply that in their own situation. Yeah, agreed. And I feel like, you know, one of the things I was making notes on on my phone was when Mark was in the first hospital. Um, I mean, it was just like once he went from ICU to the um, I think he was in ICU four days and then he went to um, a room on the neuro floor. And that morning, like the fourth day he's there, that morning, a doctor came in and said, when are, when is he leaving? When are you getting him out of here? And I'm just like, I mean, he's hooked up to everything. He can't walk. And, and, you know, all I could think was if, again, if I were 85 instead, I was 58 at the time, but if I was 85, 
I mean, older people have a different way of responding to doctors. They think mm -hmm. they know everything. And, you know, I was like, kind of like dumbfounded. And I'm like, oh, I'm waiting on insurance. We're trying to figure a plan. He has to go to in-hospital rehab. Well, I mean, fortunately, you know, I do know people in senior living and in all the different, you know, in healthcare. My one of my closest friends is a neurologist in Mississippi, and my sister in law is a nurse anesthetist. So I had them, and so I'm telling my sister in law, who happened to be there at the time, and she's like, "No, this doctor cannot be trying to force you out of there." He comes back the second, the, like the or the fifth morning, again. When are you leaving? And my sister in law was up there later and she told the neurologist what was going on and he's like no this is not okay this is i mean adding more stress to a family but i mean if i didn't have all these resources and if i were you know an older person i might have been thinking i have to go now you know i mean it's mm -hmm. just you've, i felt kind of honestly i felt bullied like you need to leave we want you out now and i'm like what do you want me to do i mean he can't walk i mean he can't talk what am i supposed to do so, um, so that's, I mean, that was why I really, another reason I wrote the book, just, you have to be an advocate and you have to ask questions. And if you don't like what a doctor is telling you, like this doctor wasn't even my husband's doctor, you've got to tell the doctor in charge, you know, tell whoever is treating your husband or wife or whoever it is, tell them what's going on, speak up. So I think it's pretty obvious from the like number of absolute golden nuggets of information that you dropped during this conversation, why people should check out your book. Um, mm -hmm. Would you please, and I think we could probably talk ad nauseum. There are actually so many more questions that I had for you, and I just don't think we have time for everything during this conversation, but we would love mm -hmm. to have you back if you sure, would ever yes. be interested yes, in that. But would course. you... Would you tell people where can they find your book? Okay. It's on Amazon and it's in hardcover, paperback, um, Kindle, and it's coming soon on Audible. So that probably in another three weeks or so, I hope. But um, it's called Surrounded by Love. And it's, um, I don't know if you can see it here. This is what it looks like. <laughs> and I chose a picture that it's not actually my husband and dog, but it really looks like them. So put that on the mm -hmm. cover with his, he can't move his right arm. So he's doing his left arm in victory because he's overcome so much. Um, but you can find it on Amazon. Well, I'm just so grateful that you came to the podcast and, thank you. you know, Emily, I mean, sorry. Amelia and I, <laughs> I don't know why I said that. Uh, story Amelia of my life, are, dude. Story of my life. <laughs> I, I think like there is so much power in hearing things come from somebody who's experienced it. And yeah. Amelia and I are both in healthcare. We both worked with patients who've had strokes. And we could have said all these same things, but mm -hmm. it means so much more when it comes from somebody who's experienced it. And so thank you for coming on the podcast to be able to share that with others and for putting it in book form so that people can access it for forever. Yeah, oh, thank I you. really, really believe that this is the kind of information that can genuinely like change people's lives and, mm -hmm. and yeah. really make people's lives better. So thank you so much for sharing it here. Thank you for sharing it in your book. We, as I said, we'd love to have you back again. Um, listener, if you enjoyed this information, if you thought it was helpful, if you liked the podcast, please make sure that you are um, liking us, subscribing to Care Lab so that you get notifications when the next episode drops, which is every Friday. Leave a comment if you can. Uh, ask us your questions. If there's something uh, that you want to know about or a subject that you would love for us to cover, let us know. And um, Brandy, anything to add before we sign off here? No, like and review it and we'll see you next time. We'll see you next time right here on Care Lab. Bye. 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 <music>
and may not represent the views and opinions of the Whole Care Network. Always consult with your physician for any medical advice and always consult with your attorney for any legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network.